This is Audible. Audible Inc. presents The Intelligence Paradox, Why the Intelligent Choice Isn't Always the Smart One, written by Satoshi Kanasawa, narrated by Paul Neil Rohr. Chapter 1. What is Evolutionary Psychology? Evolutionary psychology, at the most fundamental level, is the study of human nature. Human nature consists of what evolutionary psychologists call evolved psychological mechanisms or psychological adaptations, which are roughly synonymous with each other. Evolved psychological mechanisms provide solutions to adaptive problems, problems of survival and reproduction. Through a long process of natural and sexual selection, evolution has equipped humans with the ability to solve important problems by allowing those who could solve the problems to live longer and reproduce more successfully and by eliminating those who couldn't. Those who had these innate solutions in their brain enjoyed distinct advantages over those who didn't and lived longer and produced more children who survived and their children inherited their parents' genetic tendency to solve these problems and, in turn, lived longer and had more children themselves. Over time, there were more and more people who had these solutions in their brains and fewer and fewer people who didn't. Until these innate solutions to adaptive problems became universal, characterizing all normally developing members of the human species. Human nature is therefore universal or species-typical typical or characteristics of all members of a species. Some evolved psychological mechanisms are specific to only men or only women. Others are shared by both men and women. The important point to remember is that the psychological adaptations produce the correct solutions to the adaptive problems only in the context of the ancestral environment. Evolved psychological mechanisms are designed for and adapted to the conditions of the ancestral environment, not necessarily to those of the current environment. Evolution cannot anticipate or foresee the future, so its products, evolved psychological mechanisms, are not necessarily adapted to the conditions that emerged after they were designed. To the extent that our current environment is radically different from the ancestral environment where our ancestors lived on the African savanna as hunter-gatherers in a small band of about 150 related individuals, then the execution of the evolved psychological mechanisms does not necessarily produce the correct solutions to the adaptive problems at hand. In fact, as you will see below, it often produces the wrong solutions. Our ancestors were and had been for more than a million years hunter-gatherers, first in Africa, then elsewhere on Earth. Their hunter-gatherer lifestyle came to an, evolutionarily speaking, abrupt end around 10,000 years ago when agriculture was invented. The invention of agriculture at around 8,000 BC is probably the single most important event in human history. Agriculture necessitated sedentary life. Our ancestors, for the first time, ceased to be nomadic and stayed put in one place. That led to permanent settlements, villages, towns, cities, houses, roads, horse carriages, bridges, buildings, governments, democracy, automobiles, airplanes, computers, and iPods. The iPods would not have been possible without agriculture and everything else it led to. Four Core Principles of Evolutionary Psychology Evolutionary psychology, in its intellectual origin, is the application of evolutionary biology to human cognition and behavior. Ever since Darwin, evolutionary biologists and zoologists had known that principles of evolutionary biology applied to all species in nature except for humans. In 1992, a group of psychologists and anthropologists following the courageous lead of E. O. Wilson simply asked, why not? Why are humans exceptions to the rule of nature? Why not apply the same principles of evolutionary biology to humans as well? And thus, evolutionary psychology was born merely 20 years ago. It's a very new science but it has made tremendous progress in its very short history. 
As an application of evolutionary biology to human cognition and behavior, evolutionary psychology is based on four core principles. Number one, people are animals. The first and most fundamental principle of evolutionary psychology is that there is nothing special about humans. This realization that humans are not exceptions to nature, but part of it, initially led the original evolutionary psychologists to apply the laws of evolution by natural and sexual selection to humans. It turns out that humans are not exceptions to nature at all, but just another animal species. Scientists once believed that humans possessed many traits that were strictly unique to humans and that no other species had such as culture, language, tool use, consciousness, morality, sympathy, compassion, romantic love, homosexuality, murder, and rape. This turns out to be false. Recent scientific research has shown that there is at least one other species that shares any trait that humans have. To the best of my knowledge, there are no traits that only humans have. This, however, does not mean that humans are not unique. To quote the great sociobiologist Pierre L. Vandenberg, Certainly we are unique, but we are not unique in being unique. Every species is unique and evolved its uniqueness in adaptation to its environment. The fact that humans are unique means that no other species have the exact constellation of traits and characteristics that humans have. If chimpanzees were exactly the same as humans in every possible way, then they would not be as separate species from humans. They would be humans. Humans are a separate species because no other species is exactly like humans. But this is true of every species in nature. Dogs, cats, giraffes, cockroaches. No other species is exactly like cockroaches. Humans, as a species, are just as unique and special as cockroaches. No more, no less. Every species in nature is equally unique. The unavoidable conclusion of evolutionary biology is that there is nothing special about humans as a species, and we are just another ape species in nature. As such, all laws of biology hold for humans as they do for all other species. And this includes the law of evolution by natural and sexual selection, which states that the ultimate goal of all living organisms is reproductive success. All living organisms in nature are designed by evolution to reproduce and make as many copies of their genes as possible. Number two, there is nothing special about the human brain. For evolutionary psychologists, the brain is just another body part, like the hand or the pancreas. Just as millions of years of evolution have gradually shaped the hand or the pancreas to perform certain functions, so has evolution shaped the human brain to perform its function, which is to solve adaptive problems to help humans survive and reproduce successfully. Evolutionary psychologists apply the same laws of evolution to the human brain as they do to any other part of the human body. Social scientists tend to believe that evolution stops at the neck. They believe that while evolution has shaped the structure and function of every other human body part, the human brain has been immune to evolutionary history. In sharp contrast, evolutionary psychologists contend that the human brain is not an exception to the influences of evolutionary forces on the human body. Evolution does not stop at the neck. It goes all the way up. Number three, human nature is innate. Just as dogs are born with innate dog nature and cats are born with innate cat nature, Humans are born with innate human nature. This follows from principle one above. What is true of dogs and cats must also be true of humans. Socialization and learning are very important for humans, but humans are born with the innate capacity for cultural learning. Pierre Vandenberg continues the quote above by saying, Culture is the uniquely human way of adapting but culture, too, evolved biologically. 
Culture and learning are part of the evolutionary design for humans. Socialization merely reiterates and reinforces what is already in our brain, like the sense of right and wrong, which we share with other species. This principle of evolutionary psychology is in clear contrast to the blank slate, tabula rasa, assumption held by most social scientists. They contend that because evolution stops at the neck, humans are born with a mind like a blank slate on which cultural socialization must and can write anything whatsoever. Evolutionary psychologists strongly reject the tabula rasa assumption of the social sciences. In the memorable words of William D. Hamilton, who is universally regarded as the greatest Darwinian since Darwin, the tabula of human nature was never rasa, and it is now being read. Evolutionary psychology is devoted to reading the tabula of human nature. Number four, human behavior is the product of both innate human nature and the environment. There are few genetic diseases such as Huntington's disease that are 100% determined by genes. If someone carries the affected gene, they will develop the disease no matter what their experiences or environment. An individual's eye color or blood type is also 100% determined by genes. So these and a very few other traits are entirely genetically determined. Otherwise, there are no human traits that are 100% determined by genes. Nor are there any serious scientists who think that there are complex human behaviors that are entirely determined by genes. Contrary to what the critics of evolutionary psychology often claim, there are no genetic determinists in science. Genes, for most traits, seldom express themselves in a vacuum. Their expressions, how the genes translate into behavior, often depend on and are guided by the environment. The same genes can express themselves differently depending on the context. In this sense, both innate human nature, which the genes program, and the environment in which humans grow up and live are equally important determinants of behavior. Many social scientists believe that human behavior is 100% determined by the environment and genes and biology have absolutely no role to play in it. In sharp contrast, evolutionary psychologists do not believe that human behavior is 100% determined by either genes or environment alone. However, evolutionary psychologists tend to emphasize the biological and genetic factors in their research because they're fighting the supremacy of environmentalism, the belief that the environment determines human behavior 100% both in the social sciences and among the general public. Nobody is surprised to learn that the environment influences behavior. That is not news. But people are often surprised by the extent to which genes influence behavior. That is news. Two logical fallacies that we must avoid. In any discussion of evolutionary psychology or human sciences in general, it is very important to avoid two logical fallacies. They are called the naturalistic fallacy and the moralistic fallacy. The naturalistic fallacy, which was coined by the English philosopher George Edward Moore in the early 20th century, though first identified much earlier by the Scottish philosopher David Hume, is the leap from is to ought. That is, the tendency to believe that what is natural is good, that what is ought to be. For example, one might commit the error of the naturalistic fallacy and say, because different groups of people are genetically different and endowed with different innate abilities and talents, they ought to be treated differently. The moralistic fallacy coined by the Harvard microbiologist Bernard Davis in the 1970s is the opposite of the naturalistic fallacy. It refers to the leap from ought to is, the claim that the way things ought to be is the way they are. This is the tendency to believe that what is good is natural, that what ought to be is. For example, one might commit the error of stick fallacy and say, 
Because everybody ought to be treated equally, there are no innate genetic differences between groups of people. The science writer extraordinaire Matt Ridley calls it the reverse naturalistic fallacy. Both are logical fallacies and they get in the way of progress in science in general and in evolutionary psychology in particular. However, as Ridley astutely points out, political conservatives are more likely to commit the naturalistic fallacy. Nature designed men to be competitive and women to be nurturing, so women ought to stay home to take care of the children and leave business and politics to men. While political liberals are equally likely to commit the moralistic fallacy. The Western liberal democratic principles hold that men and women ought to be treated equally under the law, and therefore men and women are biologically identical, and any study that demonstrates otherwise is a priori false. The evolutionary psychologist Robert O. Kurzban concisely captures the common attitude among political liberals when he quips, It's only good science if the message is politically correct. Since academics and social scientists in particular are overwhelmingly left-wing liberals, the moralistic fallacy has been a much greater problem in academic discussions of evolutionary psychology than the naturalistic fallacy. Most academics are above committing the naturalistic fallacy, but they are not above committing the moralistic fallacy. The social scientists' stubborn refusal to accept sex and race differences in behavior, temperament, and cognitive abilities, and their tendency to be blind to the empirical reality of stereotypes, reflect their moralistic fallacy driven by their liberal political convictions. The left-wing denial of certain inconvenient empirical truths culminates in the wholesale postmodern denial of scientific objectivity and the concept and possibility of scientific truth. Conservatives, too, deny some empirical truths, like evolution, but they do not deny that there is such a thing as a scientific truth. But once again, we do not have to worry about conservatives in academia, because there are very few of them, and you will find out why in Chapter 5. There are virtually no creationists who deny evolution among the faculties of American universities, but there are many, many postmodernists who deny scientific objectivity. It is actually very easy to avoid both fallacies, both leaps of logic, by simply never talking about what ought to be at all, and only talking about what is. It is not possible to commit either the naturalistic or the moralistic fallacy if scientists never talk about ought. Scientists, by which I mean basic scientists, not applied scientists like engineers and physicians, do not draw moral conclusions and implications from the empirical observations they make, and they are not guided in their observations by moral and political principles. Real scientists basic scientists, only care about what is, and do not at all care about what ought to be. In this book, I will only talk about what is, and will never talk about what ought to be. What does natural mean? It is always important in any discussion of science to avoid the naturalistic and moralistic fallacies, but it is particularly important to remember not to be tempted by them when you read this book. From a purely biological perspective, natural only means that for which the organism is evolutionarily designed, and unnatural only means that for which the organism is not evolutionarily designed. The only organisms that I will talk about in this book are humans. From a purely scientific perspective, murder and rape are completely natural for humans. And getting a Ph.D. in evolutionary psychology is completely unnatural, which is partly why intelligent people do it. Natural decidedly does not mean good, valuable, or desirable, and unnatural decidedly does not mean their opposites. One of the consistent themes in this book is that intelligent people often do unnatural things. 
there are only two legitimate criteria by which to evaluate scientific ideas and theories, logic and evidence. Accordingly, you may justifiably criticize evolutionary psychological theories or any other theories in science if they are logically inconsistent within themselves or if there is credible scientific evidence against them. As a scientist, as the scientific fundamentalist, I take all such criticisms seriously. However, you may not criticize scientific theories, whether mine or otherwise, simply because their implications are immoral, ugly, contrary to our ideals, or offensive to some or all. I can tell you right now that the implications of many of the scientific ideas and theories discussed in this book, whether mine or otherwise, are indeed immoral, ugly, contrary to our ideals, or offensive to some group of people. They are very offensive to me, but it doesn't matter. The truth is the only guiding principle in science, and it is the most important thing for all scientists. In fact, it is the only important thing. Nothing else matters in science besides the truth. However, I also believe that any solution to a social problem must start with the correct assessment of the problem itself and its possible causes. We can never devise a correct solution to a problem if we don't know what its ultimate causes are. So the true observations are important foundations of both basic science and social policy. If you do care about solving social problems, which of course I don't. If what I say is wrong, because it is illogical or lacks credible scientific evidence. If it is not true, then it is my problem. It is my job as a scientist, then, to construct better theories or collect more evidence. In contrast, if what I say offends you, it is your problem. My credo as a scientist, which undergirds my scientific fundamentalism, is, if the truth offends people, it is our job as scientists to offend them. As a scientist, as the scientific fundamentalist, I don't care if people or die. I just want to know why. Chapter 2 The Nature and Limitations of the Human Brain in this chapter, I will focus on the human brain as an evolved organ and talk about how evolution has shaped and designed the human brain to have certain limitations and constraints. I will introduce you to a very fundamental observation in evolutionary psychology, which I call the Savannah Principle. The Savannah Principle Evolutionary adaptations, whether they are physical or psychological, are designed for and adapted to the conditions of the ancestral environment during the period of their evolution, not necessarily to the conditions of the current environment. Evolution cannot anticipate or foresee the future. It can only respond to conditions in the past. So it is impossible for it to design adaptations that will suit conditions that have not yet existed. This is easiest to see in the case of physical adaptations, such as the vision and color recognition system. What color is a banana? A banana is yellow in the sunlight and in the moonlight. It is yellow on a sunny day, on a cloudy day, on a rainy day. It is yellow at dawn and at dusk. The color of a banana appears constantly yellow to the human eye under all these conditions despite the fact that the actual wavelengths of the light reflected by the surface of the banana under these varied conditions are different. Objectively, they are not the same color all the time. However, the human eye and color recognition system can compensate for these varied conditions because they all occurred during the course of the evolution of the human vision system and the visual cortex can perceive the objectively varied colors as constantly yellow. So, a banana looks yellow under all conditions, except in a parking lot at night. Under the sodium vapor lights commonly used to illuminate parking lots, a banana does not appear natural yellow. This is because the sodium vapor lights did not exist in the ancestral environment during the course of the evolution of the human vision system, and the visual cortex is therefore incapable of compensating for them. 
Evolution, which designed the human eye, only knew about the sun, the moon, and possibly open fire as the only sources of illumination. It could not have anticipated the sodium vapor lights or any other type of artificial illumination like fluorescent lamps, which is why things look unnatural under fluorescent light. Fans of the 1989 James Cameron movie The Abyss may recall a scene toward the end of the movie where it is impossible for Ed Harris's character, a deep sea diver, to distinguish colors under artificial lighting in the otherwise total darkness of the deep oceanic basin. Regular viewers of the TV show Forensic Files, formerly known as Medical Detectives, and other real-life crime documentaries may further recall that eyewitnesses often misidentify the colors of cars on freeways, leading the police either to rule in or rule out potential suspects incorrectly. This happens because highways and freeways are often lit with sodium vapor lights and other evolutionarily novel sources of illumination which distort colors to the human eye. The same principle that holds for physical adaptations like the color recognition system also holds for psychological adaptations. Pioneers of evolutionary psychology all explicitly recognize that the evolved psychological mechanisms are designed for and adapted to the conditions of the ancestral environment, not necessarily to those of the current environment. In 2004, I systemized these observations into what I call the Savannah Principle. Savannah Principle the human brain has difficulty comprehending and dealing with entities and situations that did not exist in the ancestral environment. Other evolutionary psychologists call the same observation the evolutionary legacy hypothesis, or the mismatch hypothesis. The names may vary, but the observation remains the same. We are stuck with the Stone Age brain which assumes that we are still hunter-gatherers on the African savanna and responds to the environment as if it were the African savanna. There are many manifestations of the savanna principle in our daily life. TV Friends Here's one illustration of the savanna principle in action. In 2002, I discovered that individuals who watched certain types of TV shows were more satisfied with their friendships, just as they were if they had more friends or socialized with them more frequently. And this finding was later replicated by others. From the perspective of the savanna principle, this may be because realistic images of other humans, such as those found in TV, movies, videos, photographs, and DVDs, did not exist in the ancestral environment where all realistic images of other humans were other humans. As a result, the human brain may have implicit difficulty distinguishing their TV friends, the characters they repeatedly see on TV shows, and their real friends. So by being repeatedly exposed to their TV friends, that is, by watching TV shows with their familiar characters, they feel like they're actually with their friends and their satisfaction with friendships increases. The Savannah Principle suggests that because TV and other realistic electronic depictions of other human beings did not exist in the ancestral environment, our brain cannot really comprehend TV. A lot of people get angry when I say this, and they vehemently deny that their brain fails to distinguish between TV friends and their real friends. They adamantly insist that they do know how TV works. Well, you do and you don't. At the conscious level, you do know how TV programs are produced. You do know that the people you see on TV are actors who are hired and paid millions of dollars to play certain roles written by screenwriters in their scripts. You consciously know that TV shows and movies aren't real, but your brain doesn't. If it does, why did you cry when Julia Roberts' character died at the end of Steel Magnolias? Don't you know that she's just an actor who was paid a lot of money, reportedly $90,000 in 1989, to play the role of a dying woman? Don't you know that she's not really dead? Why did you get scared when Freddy Krueger slashed many teenagers in A Nightmare on Elm Street? Don't you know that the actor who played Freddy Krueger, Robert Englund, is really a nice person and has never killed anyone? Don't you know that none of the teenagers who were murdered in the movie actually died, nor were they in any real danger because they were surrounded by dozens of crew at every moment? 
Your brain doesn't truly comprehend any of these things, and that's why you're able to enjoy watching movies and TV shows. If your brain truly did comprehend TV shows, you would never be able to enjoy them. This is what I mean by comprehension in the Savannah Principle, and later in the Savannah IQ Interaction Hypothesis discussed in Chapter 4. Comprehension means true, logical, and scientifically and empirically accurate understanding of how something works. Your brain, as opposed to you, truly comprehends something when your reaction or behavior in response to it is consistent with a scientifically and empirically accurate understanding of how it works. So true comprehension of a TV show is that a large number of professional actors are paid to enact certain scripted roles, but the characters they play on the show do not really exist in real life. Untrue comprehension of it includes, among others, that the stories portrayed on the show are real, and that you know the characters on the show personally, and they know you personally. The studies discussed above suggest that your brain, as opposed to you, does not always have true comprehension of TV shows because your reaction to them, increased satisfaction with your friendships, suggests otherwise. Pornography Pornography in particular, the vast sex differences in its consumption and reactions to it, is another illustration of the Savannah Principle at work. An overwhelming majority of consumers of pornography worldwide are men. Given their greater desire for sexual variety, it is understandable why men would consume more pornography and seek out sexual encounters with numerous women in pornographic photographs and videos just as they do when they contract prostitutes in search of greater sexual variety. Such desire for sexual variety on the part of men is evolutionarily adaptive. A man who has sex with 1,000 women in a year can potentially produce 1,000 children, or more if there are multiple births. More realistically, he can expect to father 30 children, given that the probability of conception per coital act is 0 .03. In sharp contrast, a woman who has sex with 1,000 men in a year can still only expect to have one child barring a multiple birth, in the same time period, which she can achieve by having regular sex with only one man. So there is very little reproductive benefit for women in seeking a large number of sex partners as there is for men. However, unlike consorting with prostitutes, watching pornography does not lead to actual sexual intercourse. So why do men like to consume pornography? The Savannah Principle suggests that a man's brain does not really know that he cannot copulate with the women he sees in pornographic photographs and videos. When men see images of naked and sexually receptive women, their brains cannot truly comprehend that they are artificial images of women whom they will likely never meet, much less have sex with, because no such images existed in the ancestral environment. Every single naked and sexually receptive woman that our male ancestors saw throughout human evolutionary history was a potential sex partner. As a result, their brains think that they might have actual sexual encounters with these women. Why else would men have an erection when they view pornographic photographs and videos when the only biological function of an erection is to allow men to have intercourse with women? If men's brains truly comprehended that they would likely never have sex with the naked women in pornography, they would not get an erection when they watch it. The same principle holds in strip clubs and peep shows, even though these involve real live women, not their photographic and electronic images. In the ancestral environment, there were no women who were paid to dance around naked in front of men and pretended to be sexually aroused and interested in them, but would never actually have sex with them. So, men's brains cannot truly comprehend strippers and lap dancers. That is why they get an erection at strip clubs and peep shows when they consciously know that they would not actually have sex with the naked women dancing in front of them. The failure of men's brains to comprehend images of naked women, nevertheless, has some real consequences. In one experiment, men who viewed Playboy centerfolds subsequently found their own girlfriends physically less attractive and expressed less love for them. 
Why would men love their girlfriends less after viewing pictures of naked women in Playboy unless their brains implicitly assume that they could potentially date the Playboy centerfolds instead of their current girlfriends, most of whom pale in comparison to them? But it's not only men's brains that fail. The Savannah Principle applies equally to women as it does to men. Women's brains have the same evolutionary constraints and limitations as those of men. This is why women do not consume pornography nearly as much as men do, even though women enjoy having sexual fantasies as much as men do. Women do not seek sexual variety because their reproductive success does not increase by having sex with a large number of partners. In fact, given the limited number of children they can have in their lifetimes, the potential cost of having sex with the wrong partner is far greater for women than it is for men. This is why women are far more cautious about having sex with someone they do not know well and tend to require a much longer period of acquaintance before agreeing to have sex than men do. So it makes perfect evolutionary sense for women to avoid casual sex with anonymous strangers and their brains cannot really tell that there is no chance that they might copulate with, or worse yet, be impregnated by a large number of the naked and sexually aroused men they see in pornography. Women's brains cannot fully comprehend that they will not get pregnant by watching pornography just as men's brains do not know that they cannot copulate with women in pornography. Women avoid pornography for the same reason that men consume it. In both cases, their brains cannot really distinguish between real sex partners and the imaginary ones because the latter did not exist in the ancestral environment. The human brain of both men and women, incidentally, also implicitly assumes that all sex potentially leads to reproduction. That is why we still experience sex with contraception as pleasurable, and we are motivated to pursue it. The human brain adapted to and designed for the ancestral environment cannot truly comprehend modern contraceptives that did not exist in the ancestral environment. If it did, we would not find sex with contraception physically pleasurable. The only contraception that existed in the ancestral environment was abstinence, and, consequently, this is the only form of contraception that the human brain can truly comprehend. This is why men and women do not experience abstinence, not having sex, as pleasurable, but still experience sex when the women is on the pill as pleasurable, even if have the same reproductive consequences. Cooperation in One-Shot Prisoner's Dilemma Games In a Prisoner's Dilemma game, two players make simultaneous decisions without knowing what the other player decides. Each player can decide to cooperate with the other player or to defect on the other player. Cooperative choice benefits the other player, whereas the defective choice hurts the other player. Given the particular payoffs in Prisoner's Dilemma games, it is always rational to defect on the other player as long as the game is one shot and not repeated infinitely. Regardless of what the other player does, you get a higher payoff by defecting than cooperating. In one-shot games, there is nothing the other player can do to punish you for defecting. When the game is repeated infinitely, however, it becomes rational for you to cooperate in a prisoner's dilemma game because then the other player can punish you on future rounds for defecting. But there are no such concerns for possible future retaliation in a one-shot game. In typical experimental settings for prisoner's dilemma games, the two players interact via computers and never face each other in person. In addition, the researchers make sure that the two players will never run into each other before, during, and after the experiment, so the two players will remain completely anonymous to each other. Under these experimental conditions, it is always rational to defect on the other player and receive higher payoffs. There are no negative consequences for defection. Yet, experiment after experiment conducted in the last half century show that roughly half of the players of One-Shot Prisoner's Dilemma games make the theoretically irrational decision to cooperate. This has been one of the long-standing unsolved mysteries in game theory for more than 50 years. 
There are some ideas, but no one yet knows for sure exactly why half the people make the irrational decision to cooperate in one-shot prisoner's dilemma games in clear contradiction to the prediction of their elegant mathematical models. Microeconomics assumes that all human actors are rational, yet the evidence from these experiments seems to suggest that half of them are not, and microeconomics cannot explain why. From the perspective of the Savannah Principle, it may be because the two conditions that are theoretically necessary for the prediction of universal defection in one-shot prisoner's dilemma games, complete anonymity and non-iteration, did not exist in the ancestral environment. There was no such thing as anonymous exchange in the ancestral environment, because there were no computer-mediated interactions that would make it possible. All exchanges and interactions in the ancestral environment were face-to-face, -face, and very few, if any, social exchanges were one-shot. Our ancestors lived in a small band of about 150 related individuals all their lives. Everyone in their band was a relative, friend, or ally for life. So the Savannah Principle suggests that the human brain may have difficulty truly comprehending one-shot games and completely anonymous exchanges because there were no such things in the ancestral environment. As a result, some individuals may act as if the anonymous one-shot games are face-to-face -face repeated games, the only kind that existed in the ancestral environment, and decide to cooperate because it is rational to cooperate in non-anonymous repeated games. This may be why as many as half the people in one-shot prisoner's dilemma games make the irrational choice to cooperate. Further, the Savannah IQ interaction hypothesis, an idea that I introduce in Chapter 4, can potentially explain which 50% of the people are likely to cooperate in one-shot prisoner's dilemma games. When inclusion costs and ostracism pays, ostracism still hurts. An incredibly ingenious experiment recently conducted by a couple of social psychologists provides yet another illustration of the Savannah Principle in operation. Humans are highly social species, and they rely and depend on each other for survival. For this reason, humans have always lived in social groups. Because humans are highly dependent on others in their groups, ostracism, or being excluded from their social groups and the benefits they provide, has always been costly throughout human evolutionary history, and their very survival has often depended on being included in their groups. It is therefore not surprising at all that humans have evolved psychological mechanisms that incline them to seek group affiliation and avoid ostracism. Studies examining the human brain using the fMRI, Functional Magnetic Resonance Imaging technology, have revealed that being ostracized activates the same region of the brain that lights up when individuals experience physical pain. In other words, humans are designed to feel physical pain when they are ostracized. Given how dangerous being excluded from the group is for human survival and how very costly ostracism is, especially in the ancestral environment of the African savanna, this makes perfect evolutionary sense. Our ancestors who did not mind being ostracized and didn't feel any pain about it probably didn't live long enough to produce many children. But what if ostracism was not costly at all? What if, instead, being included is costly and being excluded is beneficial? Would people then come to enjoy being excluded and fear being included? This is the question that motivated Aja von Beest and Kipling D. Williams to conduct their ingenious experiment in their 2006 article, When Inclusion Costs and Ostracism Pays, Ostracism Still Hurts published in the premier journal in Social Psychology, Journal of Personality and Social Psychology. In their experiment, Van Beest and Williams use a variant of a multiplayer computer game called Cyberball. An individual plays Cyberball with two other players. Each player can see the other two players on the computer screen, but they are in other locations. Each player is alone in the room. The game is very simple. The three players toss a ball on the computer screen back and forth with each other. 
If you get the ball, you can toss it to either of the other two players, and whoever receives the ball tosses it to one of the other players. Each player has a choice of two players to toss the ball to. Figure 2.1 is a screenshot from Cyberball, courtesy of Kipling D. Williams. If you are a player in this game, the left hand that you see at the bottom of the screen is yours, and you see the other two players in the game in front of you. In the screenshot, you are observing one of the other players on the left throwing the ball to the other player on the right. You are therefore not involved in this particular ball toss. The player on the left has your player, not you, to whom to toss the ball. Unbeknownst to the human player, however, the other two players on the screen are simulated actors programmed by the researchers to behave in certain ways. The experiment has a two, inclusion versus exclusion, times two, gain versus loss, design. In some games, the human player is included in a fair share of the ball tosses. This is the inclusion condition. In other games, after a couple of tosses at the beginning, the human player is completely excluded from the ball toss and watches the other two players toss the ball back and forth with each other, completely ignoring and excluding the human player. This is the exclusion condition. In some games, in both inclusion and exclusion conditions, the human players earn 50 cents every time they touch the ball, when they're included in the ball toss. This is the gain, or inclusion pays condition. In other games, in both the inclusion and exclusion conditions, the human players lose 50 cents every time they touch the ball. In other words, in this condition, people are financially better off if they're excluded from the ball tosses. This is the loss, or exclusion pays, condition. Van Beest and Williams' experimental design makes these two factors completely independent of each other. Some subjects gain money while being included, and some subjects gain money while being excluded. Other subjects lose money while being included. Still others lose money while being excluded. Then, after the cyberball game is over, the researchers measure the subject's satisfaction and mood. It makes perfect sense that human players who were excluded from the ball toss in the inclusion pays condition were hurt by being excluded. They would have earned more money if they were included in the game, but they were not, so they felt hurt. No surprises here. What is surprising is that people in the exclusion pays condition were also hurt when they were excluded. These people made more money by being excluded from the game, yet they were equally hurt by not being included in the ball toss by the other two players. How could this be? How could people feel hurt when they were doing better? The Savannah Principle can offer one potential answer. Throughout the course of human evolution, exclusion was always costly, and inclusion was always beneficial. These two things always went together because there were no evil experimental psychologists in the ancestral environment to manipulate these variables independently. There were no such things as beneficial exclusion and costly inclusion. Our ancestors were never in the exclusion pays condition. The human brain, therefore, cannot comprehend such a thing. The human brain implicitly and unconsciously assumes that all ostracism is costly just as it assumes that all realistic images of people whom they see on a regular basis and who don't try to kill or harm them in any way are their friends even when these people are on TV. Microeconomic theory, or any other theory of human behavior which assumes that human behavior is rational and based on carefully calculated cost-benefit analysis, cannot explain Van Beest and Williams' remarkable findings that humans are happy to lose money and sad to make money. Without the Savannah Principle, it would be difficult to explain why ostracism makes people sad when it pays. This is one of the many reasons why evolutionary psychology is superior to microeconomics, or any other theory, as an explanation for human behavior even when we are not talking about sex differences. The fundamental insight of evolutionary psychology expressed in the Savannah Principle is that the human brain responds to the environment as if it were still the Africa savanna in the ancestral environment for the most part during the Pleistocene epoch, 1.6 million to 10,000 years ago. 
You, the person, may consciously know that this is the 21st century, and you are a stockbroker in New York, an artist in Seattle, a housewife in San Francisco, or a student in Kansas City, but your brain doesn't know that. Your brain unconsciously and implicitly still thinks that you are a hunter-gatherer living on the African savanna more than 10,000 years ago where there was no TV or psychology experiments or virtually anything else you see around you today. As you can imagine, implications of this fundamental observation of evolutionary psychology for our modern life are significant and widespread. Chapter 3. What is Intelligence? Intelligence, or more precisely, general intelligence, refers to the ability to reason deductively or inductively, think abstractly, use analogies, synthesize information, and apply it to new domains. Perhaps no other concept in science suffers from greater misunderstanding and is plagued with more misconceptions than the concept of intelligence. Many of these misconceptions are politically motivated by the equation of intelligence with human worth that I mention in the introduction. Before I discuss how general intelligence evolved and what it is good for, I want to attempt to dispel these common misconceptions about intelligence. Common Misconceptions About Intelligence Misconception number one, IQ tests are culturally biased. Probably the most pervasive misconception about intelligence is that IQ tests, which measure intelligence, are culturally biased against certain racial and ethnic groups or social classes. This misconception stems from the well-established and replicated fact that different racial and ethnic groups on average score differently on standardized IQ tests. As I mentioned in the introduction, social scientists and lay public alike assume, without any logical or empirical support, that everyone, and all racial and ethnic groups, is equally intelligent because they are all equally worthy human beings. If everybody is equally intelligent, yet some groups consistently score lower than others, then the argument goes, it must, by definition, mean that the IQ tests are culturally biased against the groups who score lower. But the claim of cultural bias rests entirely on the conviction and unquestioned assumption that everybody and all groups are equally intelligent, which in turn rests entirely on the conviction and unquestioned assumption that intelligence is the ultimate measure of human worth. The claim is untenable to dismiss these untested and hence religiously held convictions and assumptions. Think about this figmomanometer for a moment. It is the device that doctors and nurses commonly use to measure blood pressure with the inflatable cuff with Velcro and a mercury manometer to measure the pressure of blood flow. It is an unbiased and accurate, albeit imperfect, device to measure blood pressure. It is very imperfect, as I discuss later in the chapter. Nobody would argue that it is culturally biased against any racial or ethnic group. Yet, there are well-established race differences in blood pressure. Blacks, on average, have higher blood pressure than whites. Does that mean that the sphygmomanometer is culturally biased against or for blacks? Is blood pressure a racist concept? Of course not. It simply means that blacks, on average, have higher blood pressure than whites. Nothing more, nothing less. Or think of the bathroom scale. Once again, the bathroom scale is an unbiased and accurate, albeit imperfect, device to measure someone's weight. Nobody would argue that it is culturally biased against certain groups. Yet, on any bathroom scale, women on average score lower than men, and Asians on average score lower than Caucasians. Does that mean the bathroom scale is culturally biased against women or Asians? Is weight a sexist or racist concept? Of course not. It simply means that women on average weigh less than men, and Asians on average weigh less than Caucasians. Nothing more, nothing less. 
Nobody argues that blood pressure is a racist concept or that the sphygmomanometer is culturally biased because nobody equates low blood pressure with human worth. As a result, nobody gets upset about observed race differences in blood pressure. Nobody argues that weight is a racist or sexist concept or that the bathroom scale is culturally biased because nobody equates weight with human worth. As a result, nobody gets upset about observed sex or race differences in weight. Why are race and sex differences bona fide evidence of bias only with IQ tests? The single most accurate IQ test currently available is called the Raven's Progressive Matrices. Intelligence researchers universally consider it to be the single best test to measure general intelligence because scores on this test are more strongly correlated with the underlying dimension of general intelligence than any other single intelligence test. In technical language, Raven's progressive matrices are more highly G-loaded than any other cognitive test. The test comes in three different versions. The standard version, Raven's standard progressive matrices. The advanced version for college students and other more intelligent people, Raven's advanced progressive matrices, designed to discriminate the higher end of the IQ distribution more precisely. And the multicolor version for children. Raven's Colored Progressive Matrices. Here is an example of a question item from Raven's Advanced Progressive Matrices. The test comes with only one instruction. Choose the figure that fits the next in the progression of matrices. Which one of the eight alternatives comes next? All question items in all versions of Raven's Progressive Matrices are very similar to this one. Can anyone tell me exactly how this question and all the other similar questions that comprise the Raven's progressive matrices can possibly be culturally biased against any group? The question is a pure measure of reasoning ability. The only thing it's biased against is the inability to think logically. By the way, if you're wondering, the correct answer to the above question is number seven. Misconception number two. Nobody knows what intelligence is, because intelligence and IQ are not the same thing. A related misconception that people have is the claim that IQ is not a measure of general intelligence. Some people believe in the concept of intelligence. They know that some people are more intelligent than others. But they do not believe that IQ tests accurately measure individuals' intelligence, once again, because IQ test scores typically show average differences between different groups, and they believe that individuals from different groups on average must be equally intelligent. Contrary to this view, intelligence researchers unanimously agree that intelligence is exactly what IQ tests measure, in the same way that your weight is exactly what your bathroom scale measures. To maintain that intelligence is real, and some people are more intelligent than others, yet IQ tests do not accurately measure intelligence is akin to claiming that weight is real and some people are heavier than others, but the bathroom scale does not accurately measure weight. It simply doesn't make any sense. I have just said that Raven's Progressive Matrices is the single best IQ test currently available, and that is true. But there is actually a better way to measure someone's general intelligence than Raven's, and that is to administer a series of different cognitive tests. The best way to assess someone's level of general intelligence is to administer a large number of cognitive tests like vocabulary, verbal comprehension, arithmetic, digit span to measure the ability to repeat a sequence of digits after it is given, sometimes exactly as it is given, sometimes backwards, spatio-visual rotation to measure the ability to imagine what a three-dimensional object would look like if it is rotated in space, etc. You will recall from the introduction that this is precisely how NCDS measures intelligence, which is why NCDS has one of the best measures of general intelligence of all large-scale national surveys. Across individuals, performances on all these cognitive tests are highly positively correlated. In other words, people who do well in verbal comprehension tests tend also to do well on arithmetic tests. 
and they have better ability to visualize a three-dimensional object from a different angle or to repeat a sequence of digits that is given to them backwards. Contrary to popular belief, people who are good with concrete tasks are also good with abstract tasks. People who are good with numbers are also good with words. For example, in a classic paper published in 1904, Charles Spearman shows that students' relative school performance in mathematics is highly correlated with their performance in classics. R equals .87 French R equals .83 English R equals .78 Pitch discrimination equals .66 And music R equals .63 the R is a measure of association between two variables, known in statistics as the correlation coefficient. It varies from minus 1 when the two variables are perfectly negatively correlated, through 0 when they are completely unrelated to each other, to plus 1 when they are perfectly positively correlated. As you can see, all of the correlations reported by Spearman are very highly positive. In fact, the student's relative performance in music is more highly correlated with their mathematical ability than with their pitch discrimination. R equals 0 .40. In the NCDS data, at age 16, the correlation between verbal comprehension and mathematical comprehension is 0.654, which, once again, is very high. As I note below in the next section, the correlation between true blood pressure and blood pressure measured by the sphygmomanometer is about 0 .50. It means that using a verbal comprehension test to measure one's mathematical ability, or using one's relative performance in mathematics to measure one's relative performance in musical ability, is more accurate than using the sphygmomanometer to measure blood pressure. That is how high all measures of cognitive abilities are intercorrelated. At the same time, it is also important to remember that as highly as verbal comprehension and mathematical comprehension are correlated in NCDS, R equals .654, one can explain less than half of the variance in the other. Explained variance in one variable by another is computed by squaring the correlation coefficient between them. So it means that one score in the verbal comprehension test explains 43%, or 0.654 squared, equals 0.428 of the variance in mathematical comprehension, and vice versa. It means more than half of the variance in mathematical comprehension test scores across individuals cannot be explained by their scores in the verbal comprehension test scores. What psychometricians, whose job it is to measure intelligence accurately and devise tests to do so, do then is to subject individual scores on all these cognitive tests to a statistical technique called factor analysis. What factor analysis does is to analyze the correlations between all pairs of cognitive tests and then measure an individual's latent cognitive ability that underlies their performance on all of the cognitive tests. This latent cognitive ability is general intelligence. Factor analysis also eliminates all random measurement errors that are inevitably associated with any individual cognitive test as a measure of intelligence. So, it can measure general intelligence purely without any random measurement errors. The IQ score thus obtained is a pure measure of intelligence. It measures someone's ability to think and reason in various contexts and situations such as numerical manipulations like arithmetic, verbal comprehension like reading, and mental visualization like spatiovisual rotation. Believe it or not, all these cognitive abilities have something in common and that something is general intelligence. So, intelligence is precisely and exactly what IQ tests measure. Intelligence is what allows us to perform on all kinds of cognitive tests. Misconception number three, IQ tests are unreliable. Unlike other misconceptions about intelligence, there is some truth to this one in the sense that IQ tests are not perfectly reliable. IQ tests have some measurement errors, 
which is why psychometricians perform factor analysis to eliminate such random errors in measurement. So it is true that IQ tests are not perfectly reliable. But then no scientific measurements ever are. If the same individuals take different IQ tests on different days or even on the same day, their scores will be slightly different from test to test, but only slightly. So, IQ tests do not give the perfect measurement of someone's intelligence. But then if you step on the bathroom scale, get the reading, step off and step on it again, it will give you slightly different readings as well. The same is true if you measure your height, your shoe size, and your vision. No measurements of any human quality are perfectly reliable. So the measurement of intelligence is no different from the measurement of any other human trait. But nobody ever claims that. Because the measurement of weight is never perfectly reliable, there is no such thing as weight. And weight is a culturally constructed concept. But that's exactly what people who are unfamiliar with the latest psychometric research think about intelligence. Intelligence is no less real than height or weight, and its measurement is just as reliable or unreliable. In fact, Arthur R. Jensen, probably the greatest living intelligence researcher, claims that IQ tests have higher reliability than the measurement of height and weight in a doctor's office. He says that the reliability of IQ tests is between 0 .90 and 0.99, meaning that random measurement error is between 1% and 10%, whereas the measurement of blood pressure, blood cholesterol, and diagnosis based on chest x-rays typically has a reliability of around 0 0.50. Reliability is the correlation coefficient between repeated measurements. If the measurement instrument is unbiased, as IQ tests are as a measure of general intelligence and the sphygmomanometer is as a measure of blood pressure, then the reliability translates into the correlation coefficient between the true values and the measured values. The reliability of 0 .50, for example, like the reliability of the sphygmomanometer, as a measure of blood pressure means that the correlation between individuals' true blood pressure and the readings on the sphygmomanometer is only 0 .50. In contrast, the reliability of 0 .90 to 0 .99, for example, the reliability of IQ tests as a measure of general intelligence means that the correlation between individuals' general intelligence and their IQ test scores is 0.90 to 99. So the measurement of intelligence is nearly twice as accurate as the measurement of blood pressure. Yet nobody ever claims that blood pressure is not real or that it is a culturally constructed concept. Misconception number four. Genes don't determine intelligence, only the environment. Education and socialization does. This is another widely held misconception about intelligence. It is true that genes don't determine intelligence completely. They only do so substantially and profoundly. Heritability is the measure of the influence of genes on any trait. Heritability of 1.0 means that genes determine the traits completely and the environment has absolutely no effect. As I mentioned in Chapter 1, some genetic diseases like Huntington's disease have a heritability of 1.0. Genes entirely determine whether or not you will get Huntington's disease. If you have the affected genes for the disease, it does not matter at all how you live your life or what your environment is. You will develop the disease. One's natural eye color or natural hair color also has a heritability of 1.0. So does one's blood type. Very few other human traits have a heritability of 1.0. On the other hand, a heritability of zero means that genes have absolutely no influence on the given trait, and the environment completely determines whether or not someone has the trait. No human traits have a heritability of zero. Genes partially influence all human traits to some degree. This is known as Turkheimer's first law of behavior genetics. 
Most personality traits and other characteristics like whether you are politically liberal or conservative or how likely you are to get a divorce have a heritability of 0 0.50. They are about 50% determined by genes. In fact, most personality traits and social attitudes follow what I call the 50-0-50 rule. Roughly 50% heritable, the influence of genes, roughly 0% what behavior geneticists call shared environment, parenting, and everything else that happens within the family to make siblings similar to each other, and roughly 50% non-shared environment, everything that happens outside of the family to make siblings different from each other. It turns out that parenting has very little influence on how children turn out. Of course, this emphatically does not mean that parents are not important for how children turn out. They are massively and supremely important because children get their genes from their genetic parents. It simply means that parenting, how parents raise their children, is unimportant. This is why adopted children usually grow up to be nothing like their adoptive parents who raised them and a lot like their biological parents or their twin reared apart whom they have never even met. One of the very few exceptions to the 50-0-50 rule is intelligence, for which heritability is larger. Heritability of general intelligence increases from about 0 .40 in childhood to about 0 .80 in adulthood. Among adults, intelligence is about 80% determined by genes. Yes, heritability of intelligence increases over the life course, and genes become more important as one gets older. This may at first sight seem counterintuitive, but it really isn't. This is because for adults, the environment is part of their genetic makeup, whereas for children, it isn't. Children must live in the environment created by their parents, older siblings, teachers, neighbors, clergy, and other adults. In contrast, adults determine their own environment to a much greater extent than children do. So for adults, genes and the environment become more or less the same thing, whereas for children, they are not. For adults, when the environment influences their intelligence, it shows up as the influence of their genes, which largely determine their environment, whereas for children, it does not. This is why the influence of genes increases dramatically throughout life. Sorry, education does not increase your intelligence. It's the other way around. A subcategory of this common misconception is that you can become more intelligent by reading more books, attending better schools, or receiving more education. It is true that there are strong associations among these traits. People who read more books are more intelligent. People who attend better schools are more intelligent. And people who attain more education are more intelligent. But the causal order is the opposite of what many people assume. There are associations among these traits because more intelligent people read more books, attend better schools, partly because their parents are more intelligent and therefore make more money, and receive more education. Early childhood experiences do affect adult intelligence, but they mostly function to decrease adult intelligence, not to increase it. Childhood illnesses, injuries, malnutrition, and other adverse conditions influence adult intelligence negatively, and these individuals often fail to fulfill their genetic potential. But there are very few childhood experiences that will increase adult intelligence much more than their genes would have inclined them to have. Somewhat paradoxically, the wealthier, the safer, and the more egalitarian the nations become, the more, not less, important the genes become in determining adult intelligence. In poor nations, there are many children who grow up ill, injured, or malnourished, and these children will decrease the correlation between genes and adult intelligence. In wealthy societies like the United States, where very few children now grow up ill and malnourished, the environment is more or less equalized. When the environment becomes equal for all individuals, it has the same effect for everyone and it can no longer explain any variance in the individual outcome. 
Statistically, a factor that does not vary between individuals cannot be correlated with individual differences in an outcome. And no correlation means no explained variance as zero squared equals zero. So the more equal the environment between individuals, the more important the influence of genes becomes. A longitudinal study of Scottish people born in 1921 and 1936 shows that their intelligence does not change much after the age of 11. Their intelligence at age 11 is very strongly correlated with their intelligence at age 80. So, contrary to the popular misconception, genes largely, though even for adults, never completely, determine intelligence. In fact, intelligence is one of the most heritable of all human traits and characteristics. For example, intelligence is just as heritable as height. Everybody knows that tall parents...